and of course the astronomy has a much longer history. And um, in the last century, 20th century, astronomy underwent several revolutions. Of course, you know, Galileo's invention of the telescope uh, 400 years ago was one of the biggest uh, revolutions in astronomy. So, and now, uh, even in the last uh, 20th century, we have been observing the universe with different uh, frequencies of the electromagnetic radiation. And this is a picture of the universe as seen through uh, different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Because if you look at the, um, the, the sky using an optical telescope, this is the family optical sky, and what you see here is our own galaxy, the Milky Way. This particular way of uh, plotting this, these, these images um, is that this x-axis here is the, the, the galactic plane, so the, the Milky Way is here. But if you look at the same sky using an instrument that is capable of detecting microwave radiation, just here, what you see is a very different picture. Of course, uh, you see the Milky Way as well, but if you, you know, subtract the, the, mil the microwave emission from the, the Milky Way, what you see here is, this is called the, uh, the sky map of a cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the radiation coming from the, the very early universe, about uh, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And of course, at that time, the radiation was very hot, just producing uh, very high energies, but uh, due to the expansion of the universe, as time progresses, the, unit, the, the radiation has cooled down and has now uh, reached the frequencies of microwave radiation. And uh, one remarkable thing about this cosmic microwave background radiation is that, you know, irrespective of which direction that you look at the sky, you see the same radiation coming from all directions. Except there are, that there are tiny fluctuations in the temperature of the radiation that is coming from different parts of the sky, which is shown by these uh, blue and, uh, and yellow and, and red spots. And the, 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 the temperature fluctuations corresponding to this black body radiation is of the order of 10 to the minus 5 Kelvin. There are tiny fluctuations. And you can see this the slightly hotter regions are shown as, as, as uh, red spots, and the slightly colder regions as, 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 as blue spots. And, and you know, we now understand that these uh, you know, brighter, hotter regions became, eventually became uh, stars and, and galaxies and so on. And these colder regions became the large intergalactic voids between large galaxies and galaxy clusters. So we understand the tremendous amount of uh, the history of the universe by uh, the origin as well as the, the evolution of the universe by looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation. Is it working? Actually, do you need the mic? Hello. Can you hear me in the back? <laughs> okay. Can I hear you? There's a hand mic. There's a hand mic. Okay. Uh, but again, so now if you look at the, uh, the electromagnetic radiation from the extreme uh, high energy fronts, uh, you see the, the, the X-rays and, and gamma ray emissions. Of course, we have the, one of the top ex expert on uh, high energy uh, electromagnetic uh, astronomy here, Dr. Uh, Shikumar. So what you see here is this is some bright X-ray sources um, from the Newton, x Newton catalog. So, and if you look at the X-ray stripe, uh, you know, you can see phenomena that is not observable through any other uh, uh, windows of electromagnetic astronomy, such as black holes are creating matter from, uh, from a neighboring uh, star, which is forming a binary orbit. So the first evidence of black holes come from these X-ray observations. And if you look at even higher energy astronomy then, uh, observations, then you get to see extremely luminous phenomena, such as gamma ray bursts, which are the, the most luminous Phenomena that is transient phenomena that is observable in electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation. It's, it's fair to say that almost everything that we knew about the universe came from uh, the astronomical observations of electromagnetic radiation in, in different frequency bands. In the last uh, couple of decades, astronomical observations using messengers that are different from electromagnetic radiation also has become possible. And uh, one example is the observation of cosmic rays, in which India and the scientists have played a, a leading role in the starting from the 60s itself. Here in Karnataka itself, we have a, had a, a, a cosmic ray observatory in the Kolar gold mines, which made some really uh, interesting discoveries of atmospheric neutrinos and, and cosmic rays, etc. And this is, for example, uh, the sky maps of the arrival directions of what's called ultra-high energy cosmic rays. They are really extremely energetic, have energies of the order of 
10 to the 18 G, uh, 18 EV or so, uh, extremely high energy, several orders of magnitude more energetic, energetic than the particles that are created in the uh, Large Hadron Collider, the, the largest particle accelerators that we have built, the humankind. So uh, there are you know, a few uh, a few tens of such uh, cosmic rays, ultra high energy cosmic rays have been observed by this observatory in Argentina called the Pierre Bourgeois Observatory, which are basically Cherenkov cover detectors, you know, using large water tanks. And uh, I, I mentioned that these are several orders of magnitude more energetic than the highest energy particles created by humankind. So there has been, there, there must be some cosmic accelerators that is working, that is accelerating these particles uh, to, to very high energies. These could be uh, protons or even uh, nuclei of even heavier elements. Um, we don't know exactly what they are. And we also don't know what is the exact mechanism through which these particles are accelerated to very high energies. There are models and proposed ideas, including um, you know, uh, black holes themselves, or gamma ray bursts, or neutron stars, pulsars, etc. So it is the jury is still not out uh, uh, on, on this. What exactly is producing the, these extremely high energy cosmic rays? Similarly, this is a, a, a sky map of the uh, arrival directions of the High energy neutrinos. Wow. Is communication Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the sky map of the arrival directions of high energy neutrinos observed by another observatory called the Ice Cube, which is a, another remarkable uh, instrument. So this is Ice Cube is basically a, a neutrino observatory built in, in Antarctica. What they have done is to drill large holes in the Antarctic ice several kilometers down and have placed uh, many photodetectors in this in this Antarctic ice. And when neutrinos pass through this Antarctic ice, which is a remarkably transparent object, uh, it produces what is called as Cherenkov radiation, which is detected by these you know array of uh, photodetectors. And uh, by looking at the which of these detectors are, are fired by this passing of neutrinos, they can retract the arrival directions of these neutrinos, which is shown here. Again, it is not entirely clear what is the... What is clear is that these are actually astrophysical neutrinos. They are not produced in the atmosphere. And uh, it is not entirely clear what is producing these high energy neutrinos. Again, uh, so what I want to motivate is that you know, there are, these are the kind of baby steps of a new branch of astronomy. We, uh, we, when a new instrument comes out, it observes the universe using uh, messengers that have not been observed. We get to see a very different picture of the universe, and often it pro you know, provides more questions than answers. And finally, I want to show a picture of the uh, arrival directions of the gravitational waves that have been you know, observed by the LIGO and Virgo observatories in the last couple of years. So. Uh, unlike these cosmic rays or, or neutrinos, we do not have a very precise location of the arrival directions of, of the gravitational waves, for reasons I will describe later. So these banana-shaped regions are basically our best estimates of the arrival directions of gravitational wave signals, which are labeled in this by this label. So the, for example, this GW150914 means the gravitational waves arrived on the 2015 September 14th. This is the very first gravitation waves that LIGO have observed. So you can see that it's currently it's a very sparsely populated um, sky map. There are only a, a handful of, of gravitation waves put in the sky. But the LIGO and Virgo are currently collecting data starting from the uh, April this year. And these observatories have already observed tens of binary black hole observations, um, uh, binary black hole signals apart from a few uh, mergers of double neutron stars or binaries involving a black hole and neutron star system in the last few months. So this sky map is very rapidly getting populated. And before I uh, tell you a little bit about the cutting edge of the gravitational wave astronomy, let me give you a, a very brief introduction to what gravitational waves are. The um, existence of gravitational waves was predicted by Albert Einstein more than a century ago as part of his theory of gravity called the general theory of relativity. The uh, general relativity is a, is, a, is, a, is a dramatic departure from the previous description of gravity which is due to uh, Newton. The Einstein's theory describes gravity as the manifestation of the curvature of space-time. 
even before the general theory of relativity, Einstein had this special theory of relativity, which basically integrated the space and the time into a single entity called the space-time. According to Einstein's theory, uh, you know, there is no absolute space, there is no absolute time. The space and time are part of a single entity called the space-time. And what we call space, what we call time are rather dependent on our choice of, of the observer. So, and more interestingly, gravity, any massive object would curve the space-time around, around them. So, in the absence of any gravity, in the absence of any massive object, the space-time is completely flat. And, for example, all the usual axioms of Euclidean geometry codes. For example, two parallel lines never meet. If you draw a triangle, uh, that is uh, in the absence of any gravitational field or very, very far away from any massive object, if you draw a triangle and add the angles in the triangle, you get the familiar 180 degrees. If you try and get, draw a circle and take the ratio of the circumference and the diameter, you get a constant called pi. But all these familiar axioms of Euclidean geometry cease to be true in the vicinity of a massive object, where the space-time is actually curved. So, but luckily, geometry describing curved space-times have been known to mathematicians starting from the, the 19th century, due to the work of Riemann and Gauss and, and so on. So, for example, if you draw a, a, a triangle on the surface of a football, and try to add the angles inside the, tri the triangle, you will not handle it under degrees. But you can actually calculate these things using uh, curved space geometry or Riemannian geometry. And, and uh, basically Einstein's theory is, uh, uh, is basically uh, state that gravity is not really a force, but it's a manifestation of the curvature